Well, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for, for coming and thanks so much to Katie Kroll and Mark Edwards. Uh, we're excited to bring you today um, a talk and a discussion by the Cincinnati Reds, one of the, uh, uh, I guess the oldest and uh, oldest team in, in professional baseball. Dates back to 1870 or so, perhaps even before that. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna introduce Katie and then Katie will introduce Mark and also talk about the, you know, what, what to expect today and how, how we'll operate this, uh, this hour that we'll spend together. Um, I had a chance to meet Katie about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, uh, when she was working for the commissioner's office on Park Avenue, in Major League Baseball. Um, Katie is a graduate of Northwestern. She spent time in a really outstanding program uh, for people just coming out of school and either out of undergrad or grad, graduate programs at the commissioner's office. She can talk a little bit about that as well. And then um, connected with the Cincinnati Reds, um, feels like about a year ago now, and, uh, and, and joined the organization and baseball operations. Um, she's also in the graduate MBA program at the University of Chicago, my alma mater. So with that, um, welcome Katie, and I'll turn it over to Katie. Thanks, Vince. I appreciate the kind words. Vince and I actually met at the Gold Glove Awards in 2018. Vince was on my right and Tom Tango was on my left. So I was very lucky that night to be seated between the two of them. Uh, so Mark Edwards works in baseball operations. He's my supervisor and he oversees a lot of our roster construction, salary arbitration, player evaluation. He was an engineer at the University of Florida. And Mark, I forget where you got your master's, but I know it's in sports management. Uh, so we're both really excited to be here today. And we spearhead a lot of the entry level hiring in baseball for the Cincinnati Reds. Yeah, uh, thank you, Katie. Um, happy, to, happy to be here, happy to join the group and um, get started here. Awesome, so I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, so. Mark and I would like to present for about 30 minutes. And then prior to moving into Q&A, we'd like to get to know some of you a little bit better. And so we'll ask you to raise your hands using the Zoom feature and um, answer the question, what excites you about this presentation and what drew you to attending today? This will give us the chance to get to know you folks, um, but then also I think it'll spur some conversation before diving into the Q&A. So Mark, feel free to lead us off. All right, uh, thank you, Katie. Um, we can uh, go to the next slide. So, you know, for us, you know, the first question um, starts with the why, right? Why do we uh, as an organization exist? Why are we choosing a career in professional baseball? Um, you know, what does, what does our front office do and, and why do we go to work every day? Um, for us, you know, that, that is our purpose, right? That's on the screen. Our purpose is to win world championships and inspire people along the way. And um, there's a lot of benefits that come along with that. Um, there's a lot of ways to get involved in professional sports and in professional baseball specifically. And hopefully we can give everybody um, a better picture of what that looks like day to day and what those opportunities uh, might be for you uh, as you pursue your career moving forward. So to start off, I think, you know, our goal here is to try to give everybody a feel for how our organization is structured. Um, you know, in, in professional baseball, in, in Major League Baseball, organizations typically break down into two distinct groups, the baseball and the business. And, you know, for us uh, in baseball, um, the things that we don't do, tickets, media relations, radio, sponsorships, um, you know, all of the avenues by which we as an organization uh, make money, essentially. Um, you know, the, the business operations group uh, handles those aspects, and uh, thankfully for us, they do a great job. That's not where our expertise is. Uh, for us, our expertise is on the baseball side. It's, um, you know, for those of us in the office, it, it tends not to be a lot of uh, attending games in person. 
Um, you know, that's what our scouting staff is for. Um, but it's all of the player focused aspects of um, running a major league team um, and ultimately, right, producing the product that's on the field, right, the players. Um, and so you can see here those, those different groups, how we break it down on each side. But ultimately, we're working towards the same objectives, both on the business and the baseball side. Um, you know, the, the way I think uh, I've heard it best is that the business group uh, brings in the money and we on the baseball side get to spend it. And so ultimately, right, everything comes together on the field in Cincinnati for us with the major league team. Um, our major league team group oversees, as Katie mentioned, roster management, salary arbitration, rules and compliance, transactions, payroll, uh, but really all of our other sub departments work in support of our major league team, either directly or indirectly. Um, and, you know, on the screen here, you can see uh, how our kind of opening day projected lineup looks, their acquisition method. You know, for us as a small market organization, our advantages are in how we select, how we scout, how we develop players, how we prepare them um, in terms of information medically, um, their health and performance, um, and not in free agency. And, and while um, we've spent a little bit in free agency over the past 24 months, you know, we feel like our success is built on scouting and player development. Thanks, Mark. So in addition to working with Mark on the major league side, I also have my foot in the analytics realm. And this is a lot of the, I think, innovative areas of the game where we can continue to grow in the sense of the analytics department has a lot of data at its hands. It's both qualitative and quantitative, and you can take this information and make more informed decisions. So for example, the analytics department supports other departments at the Reds and we really prioritize that integration. So analytics can have a project that impacts the scouting department. It could also have an initiative that's gonna benefit health and performance. Uh, two images here that I think demonstrate the way that we can integrate data into things that we see on the field. On the left, that's a heat map of a swing and miss on a curveball. So you'll notice that um, the red zone that's going to denote something based on the data. So it's really important when we're presenting things to coaches, to players, that it's in a manner that they can access and then translate to their performance on the field. On the right, exit velocity, launch angle, those are terms that are thrown around a lot these days. And you could identify the barrel zone based on that information. So um, it's combining a lot of different worlds. But I think the really interesting thing about analytics is that with the plethora of information that we now have at our fingertips, you know, we're getting greater insights into what's happening on the diamond. Uh, a small case study that Mark and I thought would be valuable to showcase is how we use machine learning in order to inform where we position our fielders. So if you've watched a game recently, you'll probably notice that players often look at little cards. The, the catcher has it on his wristband, fielders have it and they can stick it in their back pocket and their hat. And there's information on that card that's produced by the analytics department. So what we do is we take data science and machine learning and we input a lot of different variables in order to determine where we should station our players. So for example, we accumulate this information and then create a spray distribution based on batted balls. So let's say we're gonna face the Cubs in an upcoming series and we have all this information on Anthony Rizzo. How should we station our fielders? Where should Suarez be versus Moustakis? Uh, where should Jesse Winker be in left field? Where should Shobo play? And so we're taking all of that, we're accounting for the venue, whether we're playing at Wrigley or Great American, maybe the weather, maybe Anthony Rizzo hits differently if it's a wet climate versus if it's drier. Uh, and then we take into account the pitcher's tendency. So you're throwing a lot of different variables into this pot. And then what it spits out based on our optimization algorithm is the best location for our players. So again, in this particular situation, we're trying to um, minimize the number of balls in play, but then also if there is a ball hit in the infield or the outfield that we have someone stationed there who can scoop it up and convert it into an out. Another department that we have at the Reds is the minor league video and technology department. This has grown a great deal in recent years, again, because of the plethora of data. So this group takes into account and captures information that we then use um, for our coaches, for our players, or for front office. Uh, so on the left, that's a tablet demonstrating some rep soto information. We have this set up at different minor league affiliates. 
we also use it for advanced scouting and sports science. So this to me is a prime example of the way that baseball has changed post money ball, I would say, and that, um, you know, the competitive advantages really are leveraging this technology and finding ways to more effectively get players information. Three other departments that we've grouped here, uh, scouting, player development, health and performance. All three of these really feed into each other, into this concept of a pipeline, like Mark mentioned, about the importance of signing players, getting them into player development, and then having them achieve their full potential. This is not only the most economic route to success, but I think it's one that we at the Reds have really tried to capitalize on. So scouting, there are three groups underneath that umbrella. It's amateur, pro, and international. Amateur is the rule for draft. So um, like when Casey Mize was signed, uh, it's going to be college and then high school eligible players. Pro is after a player has been signed. So let's say he's a minor leaguer at AA. We have scouts who will uh, write up reports on them and then determine whether or not the major league side should acquire them. International is going to be everything that's non-domestic. So Latin America, pack rim. Uh, so those are scouts who are stationed all over the world and who are watching games in the KBO and the NPB. So uh, you really have to have strong logistics and administrative uh, people to keep that straight. Player development and health and performance. Uh, so again, providing players with the tools and the resources they need at each level as they climb up the minor league ladder. We have seven technical areas of health and performance. Those are strength and conditioning, athletic training, physical therapy, mental skills, wellness, nutrition, and sports science. So all distinct, but also feed into the larger conception of wellness and performance. So there are a lot of benefits of working for the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, I think that extend beyond going to games or getting free gear. Uh, to me, what I love is being able to support a front office as we make decisions about who plays on the field, how they're developing, and then also initiatives that move the sports industry forward. You really are behind the scenes and part of a lot of conversations that are absolutely fascinating for people who grew up as baseball fans. Uh, personally, I've really enjoyed working with the Reds because it is a culture that promotes diversity and inclusion. Uh, these are pillars of our organization that are very real. And I think as a woman in a, a male dominated industry, I've been very embraced and well received and that has meant the world to me. Uh, the personal and professional growth of employees is also a fixture of the Cincinnati Reds. I think everyone, managers, supervisors, wants to see you grow and succeed. And there's a long-term investment and commitment to employees, which I think is unique in sports in general. I think that, uh, you know, baseball has a lot of turnover and the Reds have done a phenomenal job of really committing to their employees and helping them succeed. So, you know, naturally, uh, for those interested uh, in a career in professional baseball, um, or otherwise who may be open to um, you know, new, uh, new career paths, right? The, the natural question is what types of opportunities are available and, and how can I as an individual pursue them? And so hopefully everybody here can leave this presentation uh, with that better feel for what we have available. Um, really for us, it's four primary uh, non-health and performance based uh, in, sorry, internship opportunities. Um, across the baseball operations department. Um, those are broken up into two distinct groups, uh, a group that's in Cincinnati, and then a group that's at our minor league affiliates. Um, and so on the screen, we've got the two primary opportunities in Cincinnati, our baseball operations trainee program and our baseball analytics trainee program. These are the groups that uh, provide that, that first layer of support for all of the uh, major league operations and Cincinnati-based operations uh, with our baseball group. And so a lot of daily support in a wide range of tasks and projects. Uh, the baseball operations trainees are primarily focused on the advanced scouting process, um, qualitative, quantitative research, um, analysis, projects, ad hoc, answering questions, um, really focused on everything that goes on in Cincinnati. And so whether that's the amateur draft in June, the trade deadline, um, or sorry, the amateur draft, I guess, is now in July this year. Um, the, the trade deadline, right? Whatever's going on in Cincinnati, um, this group is a part of, as well as some introductory level player evaluation, trying to take advantage of all of the different opportunities we have locally um, around Cincinnati to watch baseball 
uh, beyond the major league team. The baseball analytics trainee um, is a little bit more narrow in focus. You know, they're dedicated to the analytics department um, and support that wide range of group of uh, stakeholders through the uh, that narrower lens of the baseball analytics group. Next is, as I mentioned, that group of opportunities that are at all of our minor league affiliates. Uh, Katie mentioned it earlier, but you know our minor league video and technology group is expanding. There's a lot of new technology, new data sources that we have available to us. And there's a staff that's required to support all of that work. Uh, it starts with our minor league video assistants. Um, they're responsible for all of that technology, um, working with our players, working with our coaches to make sure it's implemented. Um, as we expect it to be charting games, um, traveling with the team, participating in the advanced scouting process as well. So it's a really hands-on experience in the clubhouse and, and you know, firsthand what it takes to uh, be a part of a minor league uh, affiliate um, in, in affiliated baseball. Trackman operator and technology assistant um, is, is a similar role. It's a little bit less focused on the video and more focused on those additional pieces of technology that we use to support our, our players and our staff. Um, but again, all based out of each of our different affiliates, um, our four full season affiliates, uh, the Dominican Summer League, our Academy in the Dominican Republic, and then our spring training uh, complex in Goodyear, Arizona. And so the next, again, that next question is, okay, what are some of the things that I can do as an individual to gain experience, um, you know, on that, on that career path, if you have an interest in working in professional baseball and, you know, what are we looking for? I, I tend to describe it in three different areas. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking for first the, the baseball or softball experience that can come in a wide uh, variety of ways. We've had, you know, individuals who have played professionally, um, you know, for myself, for Katie, right, our, our playing experience ended after high school. Um, you know, so again, that wide range, it doesn't have to be that you played professionally anymore, um, but some type of experience that's getting you around the game on a daily basis, um, whether that's working for a minor league team, as we've described, whether that's working for a team uh, while you're in school, a college, um, you know, summer wooden bat league, um, again, be creative and, and find ways to get around the game on a daily basis. Um, the second group is the technical skills. The reality of our industry, as you know, has been a primary theme of this presentation, is that um, you know the, the data, the technology, those hard technological advanced skills are are really becoming an increasingly important part of all of the roles that we hire for across the entire organization. Um, and so, you know, on the screen here, you can see some of those opportunities, whether that's uh, computer programming skills. Um, you know, for us, that tends to be SQL, R, Python. Um, some of the web-based programming languages as well, um, whether that's a, a law degree, um, you know, some type of technical skill that you're able to bring to the table and add value to the organization. Uh, and then the third is the soft skills, the communication, both written and verbal, time management, attention to detail, uh, personal, personal skills, right, the ability to build relationships. This is a people business. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different people from a lot of different types of backgrounds. And the ability to connect with others is, is important as well. But those soft skills really tie everything together. Um, ultimately, right, it's about how you as, as someone who's pursuing a career can be creative and demonstrate you can add value to that or to an organization. Um, but, uh, you know, whether it's following along and what's going on in the public sphere with fan graphs, baseball, baseball prospectus, and those are great ways to, to stay current on what's going on in our industry. So to wrap things up, uh, we intend to post all of our opportunities for the 2022 season in fall of this year. If you'd like to submit your resume prior to that launch, you can email the address listed there. Uh, but again, Mark and I, really enjoy hearing from students. So we'd love to take some time now and speak with some of you before going into the Q&A. So if you're comfortable and willing uh, and would like to share why you decided to join the presentation day, uh, please feel free to raise your hand and Mark and I'll go around and call on you guys.
Okay, Blake's first. Let's hear it. Yeah, I, I can get it started. Um, so essentially, uh, yeah, I, the, the main reason, well, first of all, I would say, I want to say thank you for your presentation. It was really informative, and I, I, I think I can speak for everybody when I say it was really well done, and we really enjoyed it. But um, I guess first and foremost, why I joined the call is like just to learn, you know, um, a lot of the time in this space, you, in professional sports, you don't really get the opportunity to speak with uh, people that have the experience that you have and have done the things that you've been able to do. So just to get a, a small insight into that world was really helpful, and it, you know, it really meant a lot for me. And even though um, baseball is not really the space that I particularly would like to work in and, and within the world of sports, just anything along those lines, just anything that's uh, even remotely related to what I want to do. And, um, you know, just people in positions that you guys are in, it's always great to hear from. So that was the reason why I joined today. Thanks, Blake. What sport would you like to work in? Uh, football, 100% football. And it actually exactly what you guys are doing, but in football. And I actually have a couple of questions for you during the Q&A about that. So. Awesome. Very cool. I think football has finally like really picked up some of the advanced analytics that, you know, baseball may have originated with. So cool. Thanks for coming. Noah. Hey, uh, well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you guys for, for taking the time to speak to us. And for me, I'm a baseball guy, uh, you know, a senior at NYU currently um, working as a director of baseball ops for the NYU baseball program. And then this summer I'll work in uh, with the PDP USA baseball PDP uh, in the Appalachian league. But um, yeah, I mean, just to get the opportunity to hear what you guys are looking for and, and you know, the types of the skill sets. I know computer programming is huge and it's something that I'm definitely working on. So seeing that I'm on the right track with that. And, um, you know, it's cool to get a glimpse into the different areas and how the industry is broken down. And, and uh, just thank you, because it's a rare opportunity to get this kind of information. Yeah, you're welcome. So NYU plays at the Brooklyn Cyclones field, yeah. if I'm correct. Yeah. I love that ballpark. Very cool. <laughs> Thanks, Noah. Uh, David, what do you have? Yes, uh, thank you guys for presenting today. Um, I came just, uh, I'm in the grad program, uh, focused on sports business with the concentration in franchise operations. So this is really connected to what I wanted to hear. Um, I'm actually taking a basketball analyst course right now. So um, a lot of our conversation, although it's basketball related, you know, baseball is kind of the forerunner in, in terms of analytics. So um, our conversation kind of leads to that to kind of just see what you guys are doing with our studio and to kind of showing us how you really use your analytics to better prepare your players uh, to perform in the field is really interesting. And so um, thank you for having me and I'm uh, glad I could hear. Awesome. Thanks, David. Uh, Alejandro. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, as, as the others were saying, for, for being here today. I think we can really appreciate the, um, the insider information you're giving us. Um, I'm also not, um, baseball is not maybe my, you know, favorite or sport or what I would like to go into. I'm more a basketball kind of guy, a tennis kind of guy. But I think that, um, you know, from a professional sports franchise's point of view, um, we don't, as Noah was saying, we don't really get a lot of the information you're providing. Um, we see what's going on. We see what's, you know, we watch the games and um, we see uh, a team success, but we don't often think about what's going on behind the scenes, how many people and little pieces of the mosaic and so many stakeholders um, from the, you know, scout interns to big managers. And um, I'm actually taking a course right now, professional sports franchises, that's um, really allowing me to understand all the various different bits and pieces of the, you know, to the, the baseball sports operations and the, and the, um, and the business side. And this was a really great opportunity to actually see it concretely in practice. Awesome. Did you say tennis was one of the sports that you also enjoy? I'm curious, what opportunities would exist in tennis? Would it be like working for the USTA as a whole? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, obviously they're slightly more event specific as compared to maybe MLB or, or the other major leagues. Um, so it could be also maybe the U S open, but I'm looking more to, yeah, USTA, um, some of the big, um, event producing bodies and governing works. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, Hansel. Um, hello. Yeah. Thank you for providing this session. And I'm a freshman from Korea and I have a, I'm a great, I'm a huge baseball fan and I grew up watching like KBO and MLB. And yet I don't have much experience with the sports industry, particularly baseball. So I just wanted to see what uh, professional baseball teams require or wants to see from their applicants or students. 
And it's, it was interesting these days, like how a lot of players from like Asia, like KBO are going to a major league and how data analytics are becoming big part also in Korea. So yeah, it was interesting to see and hear like what are some requirements and what are some preferred topics that I might have to study. Thank you. What do you notice as being the biggest differences between the Korean game and the United States? Um, I feel like uh, MLB is more like a uh, business while um, Korean baseball, it's more like, you know, it's owned by its companies. So it's more towards like promoting their brands and values. So I think it plays more role as like a social responsibility or entertainment a while MLB teams, you know, their business themselves, like, so I think that's the main differences. And also, uh, I mean, before you know, MLB, they already started like uh, focusing on like the data analytics while, you know, Korean teams, it's been not much of it, but recently like a lot of steps from MLB are coming to KBO. So I think data analytics will also become a big part. Absolutely, thank you. I think we have one more. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. I also thank you, Katie and uh, Mr. Edwards. Uh, my name is Jason, you can call me. So I'm from China. So uh, previously I had internship experience in FIBA Asia as the digital media internship. And currently I have, I'm having a marketing uh, internship position at a James Park Production, which is located in Los Angeles. And I saw like uh, you and Mr. Edwards shared, also, also had the uh, communication and um, marketing related experience before you worked for the Cincinnati Reds bas baseball operations. So I, my question is how, uh, uh, do, how to how uh, how do your uh, media uh, communication and marketing related experience like facilitate with your uh, work in the uh, sports operation uh, departments? That's an awesome question. I'll let Mark go first because that's a really good point. Both Mark and I had experience more on the business side before we transitioned to baseball. Yeah, I, I think ultimately, right, it comes down to how are we able to creatively solve problems? And, um, you know, there, there are baseball specific problems in our case at this point. But, you know, ultimately, I think from my perspective, those are transferable skills, no matter what uh, sport you may be working in, no matter what industry you may be working in. So, you know, for me, you know, trying to take that creative lens, it was a great experience in a, in a different type of field where, um, you know, the problems were not baseball related, but again, right, it's, it's trying to solve problems and, and use all of the tools that you have available to you. And, and, you know, we've talked about how much those can be the, the analytical skills, the critical thinking, the communication, but, um, you know, an ability to solve problems creatively is, is something that um, is extremely valuable to us as an organization. Definitely. I completely agree with that. For me personally, uh, when I worked for the Cubs in 2016, I planned the World Series trophy tour. So that just absolutely solidified my desire to work in baseball. And I think being part of something larger than myself that I don't think I would have found in a different industry. So I would say my business experiences were really crucial in helping direct me on this path. Thank you. You're welcome. Andy? Hi, just, just thank you for being here. So uh, yes, and uh, I'm taking in charge of one of your last former pitcher social media accounts in China, which is Char Bauer, yeah. And uh, so just thank you for being here. Can I ask my question here to start to begin with the Q&A? You can go ahead. I think Sierra has her hand raised, but please go ahead, Andy. Uh, okay, all right, so yes. So uh, yes, and we, we see the improvement of the rest pitch, starting pitching rotations for the uh, for, for the past a couple of years, and uh, and in 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 winter of 2019, you guys you guys employ uh, I've, I think it's Kyle Body, right? He's the founder of the Baseball Drive Line, and his as his presence at Cincinnati definitely helped you guys to starting to start sort of the analytic work on your pitching group. And uh, can you describe what kind of role he play and how much 
he helped you guys to to improve whatever you guys want to improve in in analytic side yeah so kyle's our you know pitching coordinator director of pitching now um, so his focus is with the minor league group um, our minor league pitchers um, but I think, you know, in that role as pitching coordinator, as director of pitching, um, right, I think it's really important. And this doesn't just go for the pitching side. It goes throughout having those individuals who are the connectors, the communicators from our major league staff to our minor league staff is, is really important. Um, right. Those philosophical um, core values, core tenets of how we play the game, how we develop players. Right. That starts with our front office. Um, and our major league coaching staff. And, you know, our goal is to have that message be consistent throughout our entire organization. So when we draft a player, his first experience um, on the mound with our um, pitching coaches, he should be getting the same message that he gets as he goes from level to level. And obviously our goal is to get him to the major leagues. And so, um, you know, Kyle's really done a great job of communicating that message um, communicating how we, uh, you know, our pitching philosophies, um, how we want to use data to, um, whether it's with pitch design to help our pitchers in a specific way, whether it's video and mechanics, um, whether it's specific cues, um, you know, whatever it may be, using that data-driven approach to improve pitchers. Kyle's been on the ground, um, focused with our minor league guys, but really I think in, in a more broad sense, it's about that message being consistent. Um, and him being on the same page with our major league coaching staff, which is Derek Johnson, um, you know, those guys implementing a consistent message throughout our entire organization. Mark explained that really well. I don't have a lot to add. I think what he's referencing is um, you know, stereo teaching, like the idea that you're, you're told to throw a slider at single A, and then as you advance, you have a coach who tells you something different. And so Mark's right, Kyle's done a good job of centralizing that communication. Sierra? Hi, I'm Sierra. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, it's really great to have uh, people from the ba baseball organization to speak with us because we're, I'm not really aware of many of the opportunities, um, you know, across the U.S. Um, but I just wanted to sit, ask you something about like the diversity initiatives that you guys have put in place because you spoke a little bit about that. Um, can you like tap in on to, like some of the things that the spreads have uh, done in order to diversify their corporate setting? Definitely. And in fact, Mark and I just had a call earlier with our head of HR thinking about how we can make diversity, equity, and inclusion like a foundational part of our culture. Uh, because I think everyone in baseball is recognizing now that in order to stay competitive, you need a diversity of thought. So you need people who have different backgrounds, who have, you know, maybe been raised in different circumstances. And I think, you know, some of these hiring presentations have really shown us that there is a great wealth of talent out there of women and people of color and that these individuals exist and they can, they can add a lot of value. So I think the onus is on the red seer in a lot of ways to, you know, find these candidates and show them that there are opportunities out there that you can have and you can make an impact on this game if you want it. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so let's Switch now into Q&A unless anybody else wants to introduce themselves. You can introduce yourself later. We'll allow that too, um, but feel free to ask some questions. Yes, Jason. Yeah, I may have one more question because I just noticed that uh, the Cincinnati Reds just got into the playoff like in last year, but uh, uh, it missed uh, playoffs for seven consecutive seasons, I think, since 2013. So in, in addition to the improvements in use, uh, utilizing the analytics, what other things have uh, the, has the uh, front office did uh, in order to improve its records for last, uh, since last year? Yeah, so yeah, as you mentioned, right, 2020 was our first playoff of I think Mark froze. Anybody else? Okay, I'll pick up. So yes, 2020 was our first uh, playoff appearance in Oops, seven What years. our business is. Oh, sorry, Mark, sorry. you froze. <laughs> I tried to pick up. <laughs> Go ahead, please. 
So uh, yeah, ultimately, right, our business is, uh, you know, putting the best players on the field that we can. So it starts there. Um, but I think a lot of our, our goals were oriented um, off the field as well. What are the ways beyond just, you know, spending more money in free agency, for example, or spending more money in the draft? Um, what are the ways that we can supplement the players that we acquire? And so it was a lot of investment in hardware and technology and infrastructure and building the systems around all of this new data that we have available to make sure that we can turn it into something that's actionable on the field, right? It's, it's great to have a robust analytics staff of bright individuals who are creating incredible models and um, you know, great insights for us. But ultimately, if we can't get it on the field and um, turn it into something that makes our players better, right? it's really not that useful to us. And so a lot of those off-field investments, I think, are, are starting to pay off. Um, and then the second piece of it, I think, has been um, you know, the last three years has been an extension of um, Sierra's question and, and how Katie responded, right? Our culture and, and how we're changing um, as an organization. And that starts with a lot of the, the initiatives um, that are, you know, Dick Williams, our previous president of baseball operations put into place, um, but organizational health, um, who are we bringing into our organization? What are our core values? Um, you know, being on the same page with our major league coaching staff and the messaging that's going to our players uh, in the same way that, that we communicate with all of our different sub departments and, um, you know, creating an alignment throughout our organization as to where our, we're going, what our goals are and how we want to get there. Thank you. Alejandro. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of questions. One of them is from an organizational standpoint. Um, so Mark, for example, I know that um, you spent your whole career or almost at the um, at the Cincinnati Reds, started off as baseball operations intern, then you went to be an analyst, then you became coordinator of baseball operations, and then finally manager. So I wonder, as manager today, when you have to hire people, and, and you mentioned some of the opportunities there are for hiring, um, would you, do you prefer, or maybe prefer is not the best word, but um, how do you see the, the debate between, you know, promotions from within the team and people who are already working perhaps at, you know, lower levels and hiring external talent? Um, you mentioned, you know, the skills being potentially transferable, perhaps people from another sport or from another league and how that could um, bring added value. And to both of you, um, you mentioned, you know, your sort of mission statement at the Cincinnati Reds, which is um, winning world championships and inspiring people along the way. I wonder, um, in terms of the success of a professional sports franchise, it can be defined, of course, in many ways. It can be defined in winning on the field, um, you know, sticking with, with fans. There are a lot of teams that don't necessarily win so much on the field, but that are fan favorites. Um, or other, you know, ways that you can attendance, you know, I remember in 2019, um, Cincinnati Reds weren't perhaps doing very well, but they had one of the highest attendance um, in the league. So how do you both define success in terms of professional sports franchise? Yeah, I can take the, the first question. So it's a, it's a very good question. And when we talk about a lot, it, you know, I think I, I think about it in terms of you know, what are the skills that we feel like we can teach somebody once they're here? And what do we feel like you need to have to, to you know, have that foundation for success? And so that's changed and, and I think is continuing to change. And that's our responsibility to make sure we have a good feel for, for where that line is or, or how things are changing. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can in terms of our hiring processes, um, the things that we ask of potential candidates, um, the places that we advertise for roles that we have available. Um, I think that's a, one of the big ones that, that we've tried to, uh, you know, think about, and, and, you know, especially, um, you know, as, as a baseball team, we've tended to just post on teamwork online. Right. And, and for some of you, you may be familiar with teamwork online, but not everybody is. And so, um, you know, I think that's a, a, that's one of the areas that, that we're looking to improve, but ultimately for us, it's about the individual and the role and what we feel like that fit is. Um, you know, obviously I mentioned it earlier, baseball or softball experiences is great as preferred. 
but ultimately that's not something that um, is absolutely necessary, right? And, and it depends on the role a lot of times, right? Some of the more technical roles or um, some of the, you know, where versus, you know, being a, a, an on-field staff member, right? It might be a little bit more important that you've got some, some baseball specific or softball specific experience. So to sum that all up, I think it depends on the individual. I think it depends on the role. I think we're thinking a lot about um, how we go about approaching those types of questions. Um, but ultimately, we're looking for the, the brightest, the best individuals um, to add to what Katie mentioned earlier, to create that diversity of thought, that diversity of experience in order to you know, be the best organization that we can be. Thanks, Mark. Really well said. Uh, to your second question, Alejandro, about you know, how do you evaluate success in an organization? I think it's really easy to point to the win loss column. Um, but as someone who grew up a lifelong Cubs fan before Theo came to town, and there were a lot of losing seasons. I still have amazing memories and so did my friends and family. So I think that there are more positive memories and moments when the team is winning, but by no means do we consider last season a failure because we didn't win the World Series. Uh, you know, like we made significant progress. And I think that when you have a long-term perspective on where you want the team to head, you can see the building blocks come into place and only one team can win the World Series out of 30. So it is, it's a lofty goal, it's attainable, but you know there are other ways that we do evaluate success. But really good question, thank you. Uh, Eduardo? Uh, hi, yes, I didn't introduce myself before, but I'm Eduardo. Uh, and I was wondering, uh, this is a question for both of you, like what kind of relationship do you have with ownership and if you would describe them more as hands off or hands on? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't think we've ever been asked that in one of these presentations. So <laughs> good one, Eduardo. Uh, I would say the, the Castellini family and the Williams family, uh, they are very involved. I think that uh, it's a wonderful family business in a lot of ways in comparison to what Hansel mentioned with the KBO, with corporations owning the teams, um, the Castellinis and the Williams are very vested in the Cincinnati community. So that's been really unique for me to see coming from MLB, which was a very corporate culture, like Vince mentioned on Park Avenue, um, like very midtown Manhattan. And the Reds, I think, you know, feel and embrace you like you are part of the family. So I have uh, nothing but wonderful experiences with ownership. Yeah, and I would echo that, right? All of our, all of the work that we're able to do, um, the fun that we're able to have on the field starts with uh, the commitment from our ownership group. And, um, you know, since I've been with the team, um, you know, I've had no reason to, to doubt that commitment. Um, so uh, as Katie mentioned, right, a very family oriented business. Um, Phil Castellini is our, our president of business operations. So um, very involved in, in our operations on a daily basis. And, and, provide that support for all of the things that we're doing. Andy? Yeah, see, so we talk about analytic and uh, we know that MLB has made a lot of, uh, has made a lot of data or, and, and, and stat cast raw data available to the public. So, uh, so I just, I just wondering, and uh, how, how those data can be found on baseball savant differ from the raw data you guys use use internally to to do uh, uh, to do whatever you guys guy need to do. So, yeah, that's a really good question. So, uh, in the same way that Baseball Savant provides that information to the public, we also get those data feeds too. I think the ways that they're differentiated is probably how we use it. So for example, Baseball Savant is more forward facing for the fan in terms of their vis visualizations. We use our data for reports for players and coaches. So that's the audience we're serving. Whereas I think Baseball Savant is more from an entertainment value. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why like exit velocity, velocity and launch angle. Uh, if you ever watch the broadcasts with Eduardo Perez um, during the All-Star game or whenever they do those special programs, you know, they, they want it to be exciting and cool, right? Like launch angle, look how far it can go. And I think like at the Reds, we're not necessarily concerned with whether or not the players and the coaches think it's cool. David? Thank you, yeah. So from an um, operational standpoint, you know, COVID has devastated and, and through a, 
uh, crazy curveball uh, at the end of last year into this year. Um, just from behind the scenes, because, you know, everybody's gearing back up. Um, you know, it's exciting to hear about spring training and the excitement behind that. Um, but what has been like the main focus for the Reds in terms of, um, you know, combating the loss of ticket sales and, and uh, not having as many fans in attendance at the beginning? Um, and how do they plan on kind of virtually or, or engaging more of their fans and, and the community um, as we begin to get ready to kick off the season? That's a very good question, David. And as we mentioned in our presentation, <clears throat> unfortunately, you've got the wrong two people here um, to be able to give you a really detailed answer to that question. Um, but I think in general, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can to maximize the relationships and the opportunities that we have available, both locally and nationally, right? We just announced that fortunately, we're able to have fans back in the stands in 2021. It'll be a limited capacity, but trying to, again, use that word creativity and um, whether it's contactless, touchless, um, you know, how can we create an experience where people feel safe, but also are able to, you know, enjoy baseball, enjoy being outdoors, um, enjoy what we have to offer um, in terms of entertainment. So um, hopefully that's, you know, that's a good enough for today. But, um, uh, you know, like I said, you're, you've got the wrong two people uh, on the call for that one. No, that works perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> I will say, David, I have been blown away by how zealous Reds fans are. You know, Vince mentioned that it's a franchise that's over 150 years old. And everyone I've met in Cincinnati, whether it was the person who sold me my mattress to, you know, my doorman, they love the Reds. And that's been really cool to be part of a franchise that people are super passionate about. So I think when they can return, like Mark said, 30% capacity initially, they'll be there. <laughs> Noah? Yeah, um, I'm aware that all 30 clubs sort of have their own unique model in terms of the rule four draft and I was just wondering do you have your scout sort of scout to the model or on draft day if even if you have you know um, solid projections for a player but they don't necessarily fit your model will you go down the list to take someone that's kind of more of your prototypical prospect yeah I think we approach it as you know our scouts and the information that they're providing are a piece of the puzzle they're an input to the model um, not necessarily something that lives, uh, you know, outside the model. So um, for us, you know, our, our focus um, has been best player available. Um, and, you know, we intend to continue on that path. And, um, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's working together with both of those groups to reach the best decision possible. And I think, you know, for us, that's informed by all of the work that our scouts do, not just in their evaluations on the field, but that the work, they do to get to know the players, make up off the field, his family, um, you know, his work ethic, all of those different components um, are a huge piece of the puzzle. And we feel like are, are incredibly important to making a, a, a strong decision once we get to that point in the draft. And, you know, ultimately it's, it's Brad Metter, our director of amateur scouting, his call. But, um, you know, I think in, in viewing our process over the past several years, um, it's extremely collaborative with both of those groups in the room. Um, you know, I think we really impress upon our group. Um, you know, when you're in the room, that's your form to voice your opinion. And um, we expect you to do, do that, um, again, in, in service of, of making the best decision that we can. Hansel? Um, yeah, before I ask my questions, like I forgot to mention, like I started watching uh, MLB because of the Cincinnati Reds, like my favorite player is Shinsu Chu, who used to play, I think around like seven to eight years ago. Yeah, and uh, my first question is like, are these opportunities and like roles open for international students as well, who might not have like citizenship or residency in the United States? And my second question is, since uh, data analytics is considered very important in the baseball industry, do you think it's important to get like a data science degree or like related uh, to study related like uh, subject in college? I'll let Mark take the first question then I can tackle the second. Yeah, so our, our internship opportunities are available to, to all individuals um, regardless of citizenship status. As to what to study in undergrad or then as graduate degrees, uh, 
Mark was an engineer, as I mentioned earlier, I was actually a history major at Northwestern. So there definitely are opportunities for you, even if you are not a computer scientist or fall in a more quantitative realm. I would always recommend studying something that you're passionate about. And like Mark said, it's gonna give you those critical thinking and problem solving skills. You know, today we're using SQL R and Python, but five, 10 years from now, the technologies and the skills may have changed. So being able to adapt and pivot, like Mark said, to work well with people. Um, you know, if you spend a lot of time together when you're with the front office, it's long hours, you you know, wanna get along with those people. So I don't think you can necessarily take a, a class for soft skills, but keeping those in mind always, and I think you gain those from a lot of internships, they're, they're super paramount. Blake? Yeah, so I just wanted to, I just wanted to ask like, a, I guess a two, a, a two part question. Uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to know, uh, you guys were in either in our position or similar positions to where we are kind of in right now. So do you have any beside I mean, you mentioned you touched upon it in the in I guess in the presentation about, you know, for someone working as an intern to, I guess, be creative and add value, but for like someone who's about to go into their first operations internship role like for a player operations, do you have any, I guess, specific examples of how you guys might have added value or especially in an analytic sense or just a general kind of more specific how to add value as an intern for a franchise? I would recommend Blake being a sponge. So really putting yourself out there and trying to volunteer for things or make yourself available, even for opportunities that you don't think necessarily align with what you wanna do long-term. So if there's a project and nobody's jumping for it, take it. You know, Demonstrate that you're the person who's gonna be a team player, who's gonna to try to pick up as much information as possible. I worked for the Cape Cod Baseball League in 2017 and we had this really old school coach, he's like a legend at Mississippi State, and he used to refer to me as the girl who does the stats, you know, right? Like, there are going to be people who will end up being your mentors that you may not necessarily envision at the start. So like work to establish those relationships. And like Mark said, it's a people game. So a few years down the road, you never know who might have a connection or who might know somebody that's going to guide you to the right job. Anybody else have questions for Mark Ray? No, awesome. Well, thank you. They were phenomenal. Vince, this is a good group. Well, good. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad we can get together and do this. Thank you so much for offering to do this. In fact, we were going to do it about a year ago live, weren't we? Last, yes. uh, last April or so. And then uh, something called the pandemic hit us and that got canceled. So we're doing it over Zoom. But you were going to come in when the Reds were playing the Mets in, uh, or the Yankees, I forget which, at, at uh, in New York and, and, ho and do this in our conference room. So, um, you know, I, I just want to add to, uh, I think it was Hansel's last question. Uh, I'm sorry, it was Blake's actually about what you can do. And, and that is, you know, just take your, you know, your approach should be one of listening, uh, which is what Katie was essentially saying, being a sponge. And, you know, do it with, with a sense of humility, um, recognizing that they've been there, whoever you're working with and for have been there and they've been there before. So take it all in. It doesn't mean that, that you know, everything they say is 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 the perfect way to do things but absorb it and make your own judgments and decisions draw on your own critical thinking skills which you've honed now if you if you're you know a junior you've honed them for your first three years if you're a senior you've honed them for four years here um we we we, we spend a lot of time in in problem solving at our in our degree programs both our bachelor's and master's degree programs so you know, you should have some confidence with that, but at the same time, it you have to walk that line and 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 be a, be willing to learn and listen. I think one of the most underrated skills today in business in general is listening skills. You know, we we have a sense of impatience. We we want to make a contribution, and of of course, that's the right motivation. But it doesn't mean you should sort of cut off and truncate taking in information. 
and sort of uh, you know assimilating it. So um, yeah, I just wanted to add that to to Katie's answer. Completely agree with that, Vince. Thank you. So I guess we're at the end of um, any any final thoughts, uh, Mark or uh, or Katie. Okay, very good. Well, thanks so much for coming, um, and thanks so much for for doing this, uh, Mark and and Katie. And good luck this season to the Reds. Yes, thank you very much for having us. You bet. Take care. Thanks, Vince. See you at the Saber Conference. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> bye everybody. Thank you.